Welcome back to another series of Literal Genesis, where as our tagline goes, we strive to hold firmly to Scripture and hold loosely to theories. Why is that? Oh, because Scripture never changes. In fact, Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same as He was yesterday, as He is today, and as He will be forever. Uh, that part doesn't change. But you know what does change? Theories. Theories of, of us flawed humans, including myself, um, they're so fluid and they change all the time. We don't want to you know, put our anchor on those types of things. We want to actually anchor firmly in Scripture so that we're not tossed around, like James says, uh, driven, about, driven, driven about by every wave of doctrine. So that's kind of the purpose of this, this series here. We want to make sure that you're equipped, that you can be confident, especially in the history, the early history of Genesis. Now, last session, we sort of looked at the, the odds. What are the, what are the odds that... A single cell could form by chance or even a single protein. And we looked at how a cell is, is amazingly like a city in, in intricate detail. And this session, we're going to actually look at the second part of, of the formula, the, the, the formula of, of evolution, right? So the first part of that formula had to do with mutations. And whenever you hear mutations, you always hear of that follows natural selection, right? Mutations and natural selection. We haven't talked about natural selection up to this point. But if it's a part of this, this somehow magical formula that's supposed to uh, change microbes into microbiologists over eons of time, then we need to include it. We need to talk about it. We need to figure out what it is. Now, just a little recap. Going back several sessions now, uh, we talked about a manual, and this manual representing DNA that's in, that's in us and all of our cells. And every living thing has DNA, has blueprints. And in the example that I want to use today is a motorcycle. Let's say we have a, a manual on how to, how to make a motorcycle, how to put it together, assemble all the parts, and get it up and running. Uh, that's going to be a manual of a certain size. Now, if evolution is true, and this motorcycle represents a single-celled organism, again, never mind how that organism got here. Uh, Darwin didn't know. Nobody knows, right? Well, unless you believe Genesis, then you know. Uh, well, let's just say the motorcycle represents a single-celled organism. He's got an information booklet of, of, of yay size. If this motorcycle is going to become something like a, a jumbo jet over eons of time, we have to add to the manual, don't we? The, that's just logical. There's no way around that. I can't take this manual and make, it, make an airplane from it. Never happened. If I, this manual is eventually going to make an airplane, I've got to add a lot, a lot of information. And if you remember back to our, our session when we, when we did this thought experiment, it's not just the manual on how to put the parts together, assuming all the parts are in the hangar. It's how to go out and mine the parts, how to create every part step by step, uh, all the tools, all the nuts and bolts, uh, everything that we need. Uh, so a lot, a lot of main, a lot, a lot of changes need to happen. And remember, what was the engine that made those changes? In my example, I said it was a blind three-year-old. You put a blind three-year-old in the room here with this motorcycle manual and uh, give her a pair of scissors, some tape, and a marker and say, have at it. And 24-7, she starts making changes to the manual. Do you think over any period of time that she could come up with this on how to make and fly and mine and build all the parts to build a jumbo airplane? Not going to happen. Never going to happen, that process. So that, that's the mutations part. The, when we have mutations in our DNA, when we have copy errors and, and other things, we have external uh, influences that, that could uh, actually damage our DNA. Those things tend to take organisms in a downward direction. Well, what about the information we need to build, that single cell? If you're going to go from one to the other, you need an overall increase in useful information. Does that make sense? You, you can't stay with this information. You got to have new information, just like that single cell, that amoeba. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got to grow into a human over time. You need more information. It doesn't have eyes. It doesn't have lungs or a circulatory system. Uh, it doesn't have, a, doesn't have a brain, right? Somehow you need instructions on how to build those things if evolution is going to be true. So mutations is, is kind of half the equation. The other half is natural selection. So somehow these two together... It's supposed to accomplish this over time. So we, we already seen the mutations is not going to do it. Uh, in fact, there are many, many scientists who've been working for the last few decades on trying to figure another mechanism outside of mutations and natural selection. Um, 
So far, nothing is really stuck, but there are alternative theories. But for now, this remains the, the dominant paradigm. Is this Darwinian, this macro uh, evolution, or we call neo-Darwinian, or the new Darwinian uh, synthesis. Okay, so what is natural selection? We're talking about natural selection. Um, here's what it is not. It is not a mind. It is not a force. We're not talking about something from Star Wars here that has an effect on, on nature. Uh, natural selection is more of an observation. And I've got an analogy to kind of describe that here in a moment. But kind of, kind of like evolution in general, where evolution is mindless, it's, um, it's non-intelligent, it has no purpose, uh, it's based on chance and randomness. Natural selection sort of the same way, but it's more of an observation of, of the first half of the formula. And to give an example, if we start with a couple of dogs, you can see one has a long fur and the other has short fur. And uh, by the way, where is the information stored within these dogs on long fur and short fur? It's, it's in the genes, it's in the DNA, right? So this dog, has uh, genes for long fur, this dog has genes for, uh, for short fur. And let's say these, these dogs have uh, some, some puppies, some, some baby dogs. Um, and by the way, evolution, natural selection, they require the idea of reproduction. None, none of it works if you can't reproduce, which does bring up a lot of interesting questions. How did that single cell that can divide and replicate, okay, I, I get that concept, how did it turn into to genders? that have different parts and different reproduction systems. It's, it boggles the mind. We have uh, both, both dogs here. Let's say they have, uh, have some puppies here, uh, short fur, long fur dogs. And let's say that the temperature suddenly changes. It just, it turns frigid cold, minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit, really, really cold, right? Which is going to be the more likely to have offspring that survive? Would it be the long hair fur or the, the short hair fur? Who's going to be most likely to, to live through this sudden uh, change in climate? It's not going to be the short hair dogs. They're, they're not going to make it. Um, I know, I'm, I'm a dog lover. This is a, this is a sad illustration, isn't it? Uh, but that's just how life is. The, the short haired dogs will never make it in the, these, these sub zero climates. Uh, what we are left with is long haired dogs who have offspring, who mate with other long haired dogs, and they have offspring. And so what we end up with is a bunch of dogs who have genes for long hair. Well, what happened to the genes for short hair? They're gone. In this environment, they're gone forever. You can never get them back once they're lost. Uh, and that's, that's the way natural selection works. The long haired dogs have been selected for survival. The short haired dogs have been selected for extinction. Now, who's doing the selection? Is there a mind behind this? Of course not. The climate happened to have changed and one survived over the other. So you can see natural selection is really more of like a, it's like a hindsight process. We can see why the short haired dogs disappeared from this climate and why the long haired dogs thrive. They've been selected naturally, of course, right? It's an observation. Now we'll say this, natural selection is observable. In fact, the first person that we have history of that wrote about natural selection was Edward Blythe. He was a, a Christian who believed in creation, who believed in the Bible. He came up with it and wrote about it 25 years before Darwin. Darwin just used it in a different way and, and actually popularized it. So as a Christian, this, this doesn't bother me. This, this is something observable. I have no problem with natural selection at all. But does it help mutations in any kind of way create this idea of, of, uh, of goo to you, right? It's from its primordial soup uh, to human beings over billions of years of time. Well, let's ask a few more questions about natural selection. So going back to our, our dog example, and as I stated, it's really all about reproduction. If you're not gonna have offspring, it doesn't matter how fit you are, or how good looking you are, or how strong you are, or, or how popular you are in, in, in your climate that you're in, um, if you're not going to pass on your genes, then it doesn't matter in, in the eyes in terms of evolution and natural selection. So this is all about offspring. And sometimes we think about natural selection as being survival of the fittest. That I, I really don't like that term because it has nothing to do with physical fitness. We often think, oh, you know, the bigger, the stronger species are going to survive over the smaller and weaker. It has nothing to do with it. 
if that weaker, smaller species can have more offspring and those offspring can have more offspring, that's what it's about. And that's what natural selection needs to work uh, against. So it's all about reproduction. Now you notice in our example of dogs, we started with dogs, long hair and short hair, and we ended with dogs, just long haired dogs. Now think about that for a second. Did, did anything really change? We started with dogs, we ended with dogs. Natural selection selected one type of dog with the short hair for extinction, that's true, but nothing changed. We still have dogs at the end of the day. In fact, information was lost. Those dogs that had genes to produce short hair, they're gone. They're out of the gene pool. They're gone forever. You can never get them back. So natural selection is a process that doesn't add information, does it? But evolution requires the addition of useful information. Remember that motorcycle manual? If it's going to become tons of manuals on how to create an airplane, we need to add information. Natural selection doesn't seem to do that. In fact, it seems to lock information out. And that's what natural selection does. Um, and again, when I say it does, there's, there's no force, there's no person, there's no mind behind it. This is kind of like backwards thinking or, or hindsight thinking. So natural selection actually removes information from the genetic population. It locks it out forever. You can never get it back. Um, how does this process work to, in, in hand in hand with, with mutations then? That's, that should be a good question. In order to kind of answer that, I want to go back to a scripture here in Matthew 19, 12. This is Jesus speaking. Uh, this may seem like an odd verse to talk about natural selection, but just, just stick with me. Jesus says, for there are eunuchs, and by the way, eunuchs, in case you don't know, is uh, we'll say a eunuch is someone who can't have offspring. They can't have children. Um, and he says, there are eunuchs who are born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by people. And there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So we've got three types of people we're, talk we're talking about here uh, who can't have children either because they were made that way or born that way or they, they, they choose not to have offspring. We'll look at it that way. Okay, so there's our three people, born that way, made that way, chose that way. And here's our, our, our eunuch. Um, it doesn't really matter right now which of the three they fall under because we're going to be talking about natural selection. I want to compare the eunuch to a man and a woman um, who, who have offspring, who have children. Now we need to look at this from the genetic perspective. Because remember, if the DNA manual doesn't change, we're always going to get a motorcycle. We need an airplane. Uh, if the DNA doesn't change in a bacterium, we're always going to get a bacterium. We're never going to get a basketball player. Uh, it doesn't matter how long of time we have. We've got to change the manual. So now these are not chemical test strips that you use to test your pool water with. I apologize for the illustration. This was my idea of how to illustrate uh, DNA in, in kind of a simple way. So if we kind of start with the, uh, the eunuch here, the person who is not going to have offspring, um, they have a unique combination of DNA represented by the different colors. Now obviously I wasn't going to put three billion color swatches on here. That's, you know, that's too big. So this represents DNA in a small way. And the, the man and a woman who have an offspring, you can see they also have unique DNA, combination of DNA that they receive from their parents. And their child is now has a unique combination of DNA from, from mother and father. So all four of these individuals have uniquely combined DNA through the process of, of heredity. Now what happens when the child grows up and does the same thing? Marries and has offspring. Well. They're just contributing to the gene pool, right? This overall concept of a gene pool. So all this wonderful variation and beautifully uh, different combinations of DNA end up in a pool that when you go choose a husband or a wife, um, you're, you're, you're drawing more of that variation out of the pool. The longer time goes on, the more wonderful combinations and variations you have here. Um, and I can see that as being a part of God's design, starting with just one man and one woman how we have all the different skin types and, and features and, and short and tall and uh, different colors of hair, all of that, right? The more time goes on, the more variety you get out of these, these genes. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Well, what happens to the, the eunuch's very unique combination of, of, of DNA? Well, it doesn't contribute to the gene pool, does it? Where does it go? Well, it, it goes nowhere. 
So the, the eunuch will be naturally selected for extinction, right? Regardless of, of whether he was born that way or made that way or chose that, it doesn't matter. His genes are not being contributed to the gene pool. And so natural selection eliminates, it never creates. Let that sink in just for a second. It eliminates information, but never creates. No example do we have of natural selection creating new information in, in DNA, uh, a new organ, um, a, a, new, a new type of appendix, or a new better way of breathing, for example. It never does those things, but it locks out information, which is just the opposite. Now, there are lots of examples that you'll, you may hear from time to time on natural selection. Uh, I've listed a few here. Uh, the peppered moths, I, I put at the top of the list. I have to put that at the top of the list. If you're not familiar with the famous uh, peppered moth illustration, it goes something like this. Uh, in pre-industrial uh, times of, of England, where they, they had you know, trees and these peppered moths, we had two different kinds of peppered moths, basically. Uh, you had a dark variety and a light variety. And as the story goes, and I call it a story for a reason, I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, these moths would rest on the tree trunks during the day, and these tree trunks were lighter in nature prior to the Industrial Revolution. And so the lighter moths would blend in more with the tree trunks, so birds would come along and eat the darker ones. Now, what happened during the Industrial Revolution was all the pollution from the factories and, and everything being spun up, it darkened the tree trunks. And not, not darkened from the smoot, there's, there's a chemical reason why they were darkened. And what happened was, now all of a sudden, the darker ones blended in better on the tree trunks, and the lighter ones were more exposed. And so the birds preferred the lighter ones, presumably because they could see them easier. Um, and when they captured moths you know, throughout this Industrial Revolutionary process, they noticed that the, the population of the darker moths increased greatly, and the population of the white moths were dwindling down and down, getting lower and lower. So in terms of natural selection, what happened? The darker moths were selected for survival. The whiter moths were selected for extinction, or at least they were headed that way. Now, as it turns out, the story was kind of fabricated, kind of made up. Um, it turns out these moths don't rest on the tree trunks during the day. Uh, and in fact, they, they tend to be active at night, not during the day. And the pictures that were posted with these moths on the tree trunks Turned out they were, they were dead moths who were glued to the tree trunks. But, but regardless of that, regardless of whether it was a hoax or not, it doesn't matter. The concept is still the same. Um, we started with peppered moths. What did we end with? Peppered moths, right? We started with genetic information for light and dark. What did we end with? Well, if, if the story had played out, we would have ended with only genetic information for darker moths. Where did the genetic information for the lighter moths go? They were gone. They were lost. Natural selection would have locked it out of the gene pool forever to be lost, never to be retained again. Uh, the second one I'll talk about here, I'm not going to talk about all these, is bacterial resistance. Um, so no longer is pepper moths the poster child of, of evolution in action. Don't fall for the bait and switch. Now this, this is true regardless of anything you're talking about, any subject, right? When, when you start with one type of, of concept and word and then somewhere midway terminology switched. So here, this is exactly what happens with peppered moths. They talk about natural selection, but somewhere in the conversation it switches to evolution in action. Really? That's macroevolution? How, how is that macroevolution? Ask the critical questions. Uh, don't fall for the bait and switch. So now bacterial resistance kind of has floated up to the top. I was watching some lectures this past week on, on natural selection. Um, by some very, uh, very prominent scientists. Uh, I was surprised to see this one mentioned. It, it's still mentioned, even though it's kind of been known to be a hoax and fabricated. And, and this one was mentioned right after it, bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Well, what does that mean? Um, how is that natural selection? Well, if you take a, take a bacterial cell that, uh, let's say it's inside our bodies and it's not a good bacteria, let's, let's say it's a bad bacteria, it's gonna do us harm. Uh, we, we don't want it there, we need to get rid of it. Uh, one way to get rid of it is with antibiotics. Now there's several ways you can kill bacteria with antibiotics. One of those ways is that once the antibiotic is in your system, that it, it's attracted to the, uh, the bacterium. How does that work? Well, the, the bacterium's uh, shell, if you will, that, that kind of surround the bacterium, has a negative charge. 
So they create, this is, this is ingenious, right? They create an antibiotic that has a positive charge so that they naturally want to go together. And once that antibiotic is, is attached to the bacterium, uh, it can begin the process of killing it. Uh, another way is to get the antibiotic into the cell, into the bacterium. And it does that through these little pores uh, we call transports. Um, the surface of the, the, uh, the uh, bacterium has, has multiple transports. It needs those so that it could bring in nutrients. Well, we, we kind of, we trick it. We create an antibiotic that looks like a nutrient, and so it readily accepts it into the cell. And from there, for example, one of the antibiotics will inhibit the bacterium from, from performing cell maintenance. It, it makes it where it can't produce a part that it needs to maintain the cell. Well, that's great. Well, what happens if a mutation happens in a bacterium that alters one of the, those transport um, mechanisms? Uh, makes them not work at all, or makes them work very poorly and inefficiently. Well, now when that antibiotic reaches the bacterium, either it can't get into the bacterium, or it's only part of it is able to get in, making it ineffective. And so the bacterium evolves resistance to the antibiotic. That's the way it's worded. But we need to ask the question, what really happened? What happened is we had something mess with the manual of the bacterium. The, the bacterium doesn't function like it did before. When you damage those transport systems, not only do we lock out antibiotics, but now we make it harder for the cell to receive nutrients. Did it really evolve? Is that really how it's gonna work its way up to becoming a basketball player over billions of years? By damaging processes in the DNA that it needs to survive? That doesn't sound like a, like a good process. So we need to start asking two questions when we hear about these natural selection examples. Um, again, natural selection is observable. Have no problem with that. Now, that's good science. First question, what'd you start and end with? We started with peppered moths. We started with bacterium. We ended with pepper moths. We ended with bacterium. What really changed? Nothing changed. If you're gonna go from one to the other, you've gotta have, you got have massive change. And secondly, was there a gain in useful information? Well, in, in the example of the pepper moths, we've seen that the genes that produce the lighter colored moths, those were locked out. Those were lost forever. In the case of the bacterial resistance to antibiotics, we had a, a wreck, we had a damage in, in the DNA that uh, limited, the limited the bacterium on taking in nutrients, right? So that's not a gain of information. That's a destruction of existing information. Very two simple questions we need to ask. Um, we, we can't take any one of these examples and say, yeah, but if we use our imagination and imagine down the road when they have a thousand of these different kind of changes, that's what evolution is. Well, that's, that's not observational science. In fact, that takes a lot more faith to believe than it does in the beginning God created, something that matches our observation, that things started out as, as at their highest possible peak in terms of fitness and sin entered the world. God's creation, Adam and Eve, they, they, they messed up, they disobeyed God, and God said, now things are going to be different, and that's the world we see. We don't see that perfect world that existed at the time pre-sin of Adam and Eve. We see a fallen world. That matches observation. Much better than the idea that these processes can somehow you know, mold single-celled organisms uh, into human beings over time. Here's a quote. Uh, from a, a couple of scientists here from the uh, uh, Department of Zoology in, at Cambridge. They say, nonetheless, most studies of recent evolution involve the, what's that? Loss of traits. And we still understand little of the genetic changes needed in the origin of novel traits. So to put that kind of in, in everyday language, he says, when we, we look at these, these mechanisms of evolution, we don't see the gain of new features, new organs, new traits. We see the loss of those things. We see the damage to those things. And he said, and by the way, we still understand very little of the changes that you need in the DNA to produce something brand new. Again, that motorcycle to an airplane, you need brand new things. Motorcycle doesn't have wings. Where do you, where do you get the wings? Uh, same thing for that single-celled bacterium. Doesn't have, uh, doesn't have feet, where do you get feet? Doesn't have a skeletal system, right? Uh, where do you get these new novel traits? And they're admitting that uh, we don't know. We just don't know. We know very little of how that works. 
So natural selection, again, it's observable. This is good science. But when we say natural selection along with mutations can somehow create all these grandiose things in, in, uh, in life that we see, um, that doesn't explain it. Not as Darwin thought it did. In fact, the more we learn, the more the goalposts keep getting moved further and further away. Because the deeper we go into the cell and the more we, we learn how complex things are in there, the goalposts don't get closer to the evolutionary ideology. They get further and further away. And in fact, evolutionary ideology gets further away. God, to me, in my mind, just gets magnified the deeper we look and the more we understand uh, His creation. So natural selection? Yes, absolutely. Macroevolution? No. I don't believe you can get there from here. So what does it mean then when we're looking at, at the cell and, and maybe we don't see the evidence of macroevolution? Well, what do we see? Well, we should see some kind of design. We looked at all the videos in the last section of how the cell is like a city. It was absolutely fascinating, right? That has all the hard marks, hallmarks of intelligent design. Uh, well, how do we know when we're looking at something if it was designed or if it came about by nature? I got a few very simple examples. Take a look at this picture, uh, first picture on the left here. What, what do you kind of see as you're looking at that? What pops out at you? Looks like a face, doesn't it? You can kind of see, uh, see an eye structure up here. There, there's uh, obviously uh, what looks like a nose and maybe a mouth down here. Um, this kind of piece here looks like it could be an ear. Um, I say could be, it doesn't exactly look like a face, but it really does look like a face. Now this particular rock formation is, uh, is found on the island of Maui in Hawaii. There's another rock formation that we can compare it to that really look like faces. They have all the, all the things you would look for in a face. In fact, you could look at it from different angles. It would still look like a face. This particular rock formation, when you go around to the other side, it no longer looks like a face. It only looks like a face from, from this particular angle. So the question is, which one was designed and which one was formed completely by natural processes? This is an easy one. You should get this one. Obviously, the one on the left was formed by nature, and the one on the right was intelligently designed. This has specified complexity. I think that's what we're looking for in determining whether something was designed or not. They're both made out of rock. They were both carved, one by wind and erosion, and the other by human hands. But one has more specified complexity. All right, how about this one? Looking at uh, two different beaches here, the one on the left, uh, and actually, I actually like these, the designs when you're out on the beach and the waves come in and then they, they go out and you see what's left behind. Um, I could look at these for hours, they're incredible. But compare that to the design we see on the beach on the right. Now, which one was formed by nature? Which one was formed by a mind, or, or in this case, a human? Uh, this is a no-brainer. When we look at this, we never see nature with this type of specified complexity, or complexity, I should say, excuse me. Uh, we see patterns, sure, and some of them are quite beautiful. Look at the uh, crystals and quartz, uh, absolutely stunning images, but we never see anything like this. So obviously the one on the right is designed, the one on the left is, is uh, formed by natural processes. We'll, we'll kick it up a notch, make this a little harder. So here on the, the left, we've got DNA, which is uh, three billion base pairs, or look at it this way, it's six billion uh, genetic letters, right, chemical letters, in a ordered specified code to build living things, to maintain living things, to regulate living things, right? On the right, we have a set of, let's say, encyclopedias. Which one was formed by nature, completely by random chance processes, and which one was designed? So what I've given you here is what's called a, a, a false dilemma. I'm making you choose when actually it's clear that they're both designed, if you stop and think about it. These books, no one would ever say would write themselves, no matter how much time you give it, no matter how much ink and paper you put in a room and shake it up, you're never going to get this. Well, why would we think this could come about by itself? Three billion base pairs of a code read three letters at a time that produce all these amazing structures in the cell. This has all the hallmarks of intelligent design. And this, this is why many scientists no longer believe that this could have happened by chance on Earth. 
They, they know this is designed by a mind. You can't get around it. Codes do not create themselves. We talked about that in previous session. They always are a result from a mind. So where did this come from? Well, we have a quote from uh, Richard Dawkins, who's a very, very famous, uh, outspoken atheist um, against all things you know, God and, and, and Christianity. Uh, but he was interviewed by Ben Stein in a movie called uh, Expelled. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Uh, very, very educational. But here's what he had to say about this idea of a grand designer. He said, It could be that at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and, and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this planet. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the details of biochemistry, molecular biology. You might find a signature of some sort of designer. What is he saying here? He's saying that when we look at the cell, when we look at DNA in particular, that there is evidence of design. If we look close enough, which hopefully in, in this series you've seen that we've, we've taken kind of a high level look, but we've looked deep enough to see that it does have all the, the bearings of a designer. But I want to highlight a few things in his quote to kind of draw out the, the certainty of what he's saying about this. Some earlier time. Is that specific or non-specific? That's very non-specific. Somewhere in the universe. Does that pinpoint it down for you? Probably some. Not a lot of confidence there. And suppose it's possible, you might find evidence. You might find a signature. So it's amazing to me how, and, and Richard Dawkins is very intelligent. I, I actually enjoy hearing him speak uh, when he talks about biology, but when he's, when he's getting around the issue of, of design and how things could have formed by chance, it's, it's unnerving. This does not sound very scientific and doesn't sound very confident to me. But he's saying if you look close enough, you'll see that there's a signature in the cell, which by the way is, is a book by Stephen Meyer, highly recommend it. It's a very, very thick book, a lot of words. Um, very much worth the read. But he's saying if you look close enough, there's a signature in the cell that would clue us in that there was a designer that designed it. I totally agree with that. What I don't agree with, that it was some alien somewhere else in the universe. Again, that's kicking a can further down the road. This is what he's, he's getting at, is this idea that extraterrestrial beings created it. Um, just back it up all the way, right? There must have been a creator to, to create everything. And I want to kind of end with uh, this verse in uh, 2 Peter, because uh, I get asked this all the time, especially by Christians. Well, you know, I, I talk to atheists, I talk to scientists of all sorts, and it's, it, it amazes me at the lengths that some will go to to ignore the evidence and not follow the evidence where it clearly leads. And they want to know why. And I always refer them back to, to these verses. Peter says, first of all, you must understand this, that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and indulging their own lusts. Do we have scoffers today? Do we have people that, that scoff, oh, you're a Christian? Oh, well, what, what do you believe about creation? Oh, you believe God created everything. Oh, you believe He did it in six days. They, they scoff and they make fun. And hopefully throughout this series, I've given you with some scientific evidence and examples to show that this is the, the more logical way to believe. But there are scoffers, and that'll never stop. That'll never end as long as that there are people on the earth. And he goes on, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, Peter's saying, these people who scoff look around and say, Today was like yesterday. Yesterday was like the day before. It was like the year before. It was like the century before. Uh, it was like eons of time before. Things have just been going on the same. Um, where is the promise? Where is, where is this Creator of yours that's supposedly going to come back? Peter says they deliberately ignore this fact. This is what I want to key in on. They deliberately ignore this fact that by the Word of God, heavens existed long ago and earth was formed out of water and by means of water. What does that sound like? Go back and read the first chapter of Genesis. Read the creation account where the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Peter's reaffirming that. This is how God created the world and He did it to, through water, uh, by water and out of water. And he says they deliberately ignore this fact. In other words, they suppress it. In fact, Paul uses different terminology when he says 
pretty much the same thing, that they suppress the truth. In, in Romans chapter 1 and 2. Uh, and to me, I get this idea of a beach ball. You take a beach ball to the ocean or a swimming pool and just try to hold that down underwater. Even if it's a small one, it's really, really hard. You have to put a lot of effort into that. And this is, reminds me of what Peter's talking about here, of folks, highly educated, smart folks, and pleasant to talk to, enjoy my many conversations, but they deliberately ignore the facts. They don't follow the evidence where it leads. And Peter ends by saying, through which the world at that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. And I believe this is a, a good verse uh, to somewhat end on because in our next series, we'll talk about the evidences uh, for a global flood. Uh, but Peter's just reaffirming what we read in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. So again, if you're a Christian, you've compromised that early portions of Genesis. Nah, the creation didn't happen that way. There couldn't have been a worldwide flood. What do you do with 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6? You have to somehow discount it, knock it out of your theology. Um, and as I talked about in our second lesson, there's so many things you have to do this with in the Bible if you compromise the early history in Genesis. And to kind of wrap it up, um, in this, w- within this series that we're talking about, I've, I've kind of been focused on DNA and biology. And if you remember, we, we talked about things like the, uh, the, flagellar, uh, the flagellum uh, tail of the bacterium and, and all the intricate parts here, the rotor and stator and how it rotates uh, it's sometimes up to 100,000 RPMs. We looked at the uh, electron transport chain, um, part of that last few steps in the, in the production of energy in our cells and, and how these, these single protons and single electrons are shuffled around uh, top to bottom and inside and out to create this energy process. We looked at the four dimensions of uh, DNA. We've only looked at four. Um, there's so many levels in here. Code within a code within a code. Uh, pretty amazing. We looked at the actual ATP synthase motor itself being driven by single protons, which, which uh, makes that rotate at 9,000 RPM, and it uh, creates the ATP molecule at the bottom. We looked at this single cell bacterium, the MO1, with its, with its planetary gearbox with its seven proton-powered engines surrounded by 24 satellite uh, gears, right? This is a planetary gearbox. Uh, This this is designed, right? When we design gearboxes today, we just don't throw a bunch of parts in a box and say, well, I hope they uh, work out into something. Uh, And then uh, the DNA code, which to me, uh, if you don't think anything else is impressive, you've, you've got to take a closer look at DNA with the three billion coded letters of information whose information we haven't fully untapped. We thought we did it uh, when, we, uh, when we, we figured out where the genes were, right? And then we figured out, oh wait, 25,000 genes, how do they produce 500,000 proteins? It got more complex. And then the 98% of the DNA we thought was junk, and I say we loosely, uh, turns out that most of it is, is uh, red in some kind of way. It's not junk at all. It just keeps getting more and more complicated. And it's like the person who's looking at the forest and can't see the trees. Now, what trees are you talking about? Sometimes scientists, I think, are so close to their specific portion of science that they do, whether it's synthetic chemistry, origin of life chemistry, evolutionary biology, uh, geology, and they're so focused on one little piece that they, they forget the bigger picture. The bigger picture just screams of a designer, not something that could have possibly happened by chance. We'll end with our, our anchor verse here, Psalms 139, 14. Uh, where David, I pictured David out in the field with the sheep and just reflecting on his Creator. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. And now that we're kind of at the end of this, this biological portion of our series, hopefully your intellect knows it as well, something that cannot be denied. Well, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the biological portion. Uh, in our next session, we'll kind of change gears a little bit, and we'll look at evidences for a worldwide flood, for a global flood. We kind of talked about that a little bit in the, in the, the first session, but we'll get a little deeper. You would think if there was a global flood, there must be some kind of scarring, some, some kind of evidence that we could go to look at, and uh, we'll, we'll do just that. Again, thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time.